Good evening, everyone. I am Samir today, and I welcome you all to the regular feature of the Ayuka Outreach Program, which is the public talk. And uh, I am sure uh, many of you have got this news but couldn't come because there are two other important outreach events going on in the city. And so we have a divided audience rather than a combined one. But we are still happy to see you all and to share this event with you. <coughs> so today, uh, we have the privilege of having a very renowned scientist, Dr. Theodore Williams, here, right from South Africa. So let us uh, invite him on stage, and uh, I'll inter give a brief introduction. So Dr. Williams uh, is the currently the director of the Southern African uh, Astronomical, South African Astronomical Observatory, which also runs the Southern African Large Telescope. It's one of the largest telescopes in the world uh, with an 11 meter diameter uh, mirror. So that apart, uh, if, you, if I want to briefly introduce him to you, he is uh, originally from the USA and has done his uh, bachelor's and PhD uh, at Purdue and California Institute of Technology, respectively. Uh, he's been uh, working with the te uh, detector technology development for space telescopes at the Princeton University Observatory. He was there for a few years. And then he took up a faculty position in Department of Physics and Astronomy at the Rutgers University. And he's been there since. <coughs> but during that time, he got involved in the Southern African Large Telescope Project, which is uh, the longest one. And he's been there since the start. Uh, he's been helping with developing instruments in imaging spectroscopy for that. So, which therefore uh, was a special request to him that he should share instrumentation related uh, experiences with you. Uh, uh, in astronomy, he likes, he likes to study the kinematics and dynamics of galaxies. But in real life, I was just talking to him that he's also interested in the agility of dogs. And he's an animal lover. So he trains dogs in agility training, obstruction courses, etc. So, uh, without much further ado, I would expect uh, and I would invite uh, Dr. Williams for this interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Very pleased to be here. Um, uh, this is my fourth visit to India, and I greatly appreciate the hospitality and the food every time I come. You've just been told a bit about me, so want to how about a little bit about you? Uh, how many of you are astronomy students at some level or another? Okay, a few. You'll probably be bored to tears uh, by this talk. How many of you know absolutely nothing about astronomy? And sort of wondered in here by mistake. <laughs> okay. And all of a sudden, the rest of you are sort of somewhere in between. I'll try and not get into too much technical detail, although this is going to be a talk about uh, my career in instrumentation and some, some of the successes, some of the failures, maybe a few of the things that I've learned along the way. Um, let's begin at the beginning. That's sort of a good place to start. Uh, I was a graduate student way too many years ago at Caltech uh, University in Southern California in the U.S. And uh, I started doing research on a project called Galaxy Population Synthesis. Now you may know that galaxies are made out of stars, about a thousand billion stars in a galaxy like our Milky Way. And some of those are stars like the Sun. But there are other kinds of stars as well. There are massive, bright blue stars, and there are lightweight, faint red stars, and everything in between. And then there are some stars near the end of their lives that swell up and become really bright, cool, and red, called red giants, and a mixture of other kinds of stars. And another complication is that stars don't all come with the same chemical compositions. Some of them have more heavy elements, some of them have less. Uh, 
our sun is taken as an example, and there are some stars that have significantly more heavy elements, things heavier than hydrogen and helium, than our sun, and others that have 10 or 100 or 1,000 times less heavy elements. The idea of this thesis was to ask the sort of simple question, what are galaxies made out of? How many of each kind of star makes up a galaxy? Now we can say something about our own Milky Way galaxy because we can see the individual stars and make some surveys and do some census of the stars in our own galaxy. But in other galaxies, we can't resolve the individual stars. We just see the accumulated light of all the stars in those other more distant galaxies. So the question was, are those galaxies made the same way that our Milky Way is, or are they composed of different mixes of stellar types? This could presumably give us some insight into how the galaxies formed and changed over time. This was sort of a hot question back in the time I was doing my thesis. Uh, other people had attempted to do it with a variety of techniques, but my thesis advisor, Jesse Greenstein, had the idea that the right way to do this was to take spectra, that is, take the light from a star or a galaxy, and using a prism or a similar device, split that light up into its component colors. You probably know that white light, uh, like the light coming out of the light bulbs over our heads, is made up of all the colors of the rainbow, rainbow blue, green, yellow, red, and if you take a prism and look at white light, you'll split it into those colors. That's what a spectrograph does. And when you take the light of a star and split it into its colors, you'll find that different kind of stars have characteristically different spectra. They both have different colors, and they have different patterns of absorption lines caused by the different chemical elements in those stars and the details of how those elements are excited. So if you take a spectrum of a star, you can immediately tell whether it's one of these bright, massive stars or faint, low-mass stars or a star like the sun. So there was a hope that if you took the light of a galaxy, split it up into its spectrum, and then analyzed that spectrum and compared it to the spectra of all different kind of stars, you could figure out this composite light must be made of so many of this kind of star, so many of that kind of star, so many of the third kind of star. So that was the idea. Not an easy task because you've got all these individual stellar spectra added together and you somehow have to separate them back out again. Now, this was a time when astronomy was undergoing a revolution. Uh, prior to this, 10 years before this, the only real detector of use in astronomy was the photographic plate. And these were not very sensitive, so astronomers couldn't look at very faint objects uh, because the plates just didn't have enough sensitivity uh, to record the light from distant galaxies. Around about the 1970s, uh, two significant revolutions occurred. One in detector technology, electronic detectors became available. Now these aren't the electronic detectors like are in your cell phone or in this camera in the front here, which are solid state devices called CCDs, uh, but rather these were bulky electron tubes that worked with electric and magnetic fields. Uh, and you probably, if the older ones of you in the audience may remember uh, images of television studios that had these big, bulky TV cameras that took two people to push around. Uh, those were based on that electron tube technology. Well, at Caltech we had a device called an image intensifier, which was based on that technology. It had a thing called a photocathode in the front. A photocathode is a device that when light hits it, it emits electrons. Typically when one photon or particle of light it's the photocathode, it emits one or maybe none uh, electrons. 
And then if you put an electric field in, you can accelerate that electron, give it more energy, and then detect it. Uh, when it hits a phosphor, it can make a bright splash of light, so it amplifies the intensity and allows you to record faint things on a photographic film placed up against that phosphor screen that you couldn't see otherwise. So that was the device we were using at the telescope, one of these image intensifiers with photographic film output behind the spectrograph, recording the spectra of the stars and the galaxies that I was trying to measure. The other technological advance was computers. Computers had been around for a little while. Typically, they were the size of a room, uh, required enormous amounts of power, uh, had far less computational capability than the thing that you have in your pocket right now on your cell phone. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a big stride forward, so you could do some data analysis with these. So the point of my thesis was to combine these two technologies. We had them working on the telescope, uh, we had some computers in the lab, but there was one big problem. Once we produced these films, there was no device to measure the blackness of the film that corresponded to the amount of light that hit it at each point. Uh, and turn that into a digital number that could go into the computers. So part of my thesis was to use some equipment and adapt some equipment to use old analog plate scanners and turn them into digital plate scanners. <coughs> you probably have never seen anything like this. That's a early computer board uh, made of individual integrated circuits. Integrated circuits had just been discovered back in the early 70s. They were a hot new thing. Uh, nowadays you can put millions, literally, of transistors on a single integrated circuit chip, put an entire CPU or multiple CPUs in a chip. And these days, these things were just a simple transistor gate, like an AND gate or an OR gate, doing some digital logic. And so to make a CPU out of them, you had to have a whole board with hundreds of these things plugged in uh, to do the computational function. And the computer we have is one of these things called a Raytheon 703. Uh, it was strikingly smaller than the big room-filling computers. It was called a mini-computer. still took a whole rack, about two meters high. Uh, again, had very little computational capability, but enough to take the signals coming out of this plate scanner, digitize them, write them on magnetic tape so that I could then do the rest of my thesis. And yes, the input device was a teletype, the thing that goes clackety, 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 clack, and you stored your programs on punched paper tape. But this was really the old days. One a relatively amusing story is these boards weren't printed circuit boards with etched layers of copper the way we used nowadays. They're what were called wire wrap boards. The, CC, the integrated circuits would plug into a socket, and on the other side, a wire would be connected to each pin, and then that would be routed to some other pin of some other chip, and the wiring would all be done like that with individual wires. Now, these computers were pretty unreliable, and the chips themselves were pretty unreliable. They failed with great regularity, uh, because it was still the early days of things. So somebody had the bright idea of mounting these upside down so that the chips were facing down and all the pins with the wires were facing up. So you could then take a, an oscilloscope and when something wasn't working, you could put probes on the different pins and figure out which one of the hundreds of chips was doing something wrong, pull out the bad one, put in a good one, and you're ready to go again. The problem was that these things also produced a lot of heat. So you had to have fans circulating air to keep them cool, and they were upside down, so the fans vibrated everything, so the chips tended to loosen and fall out of their sockets. So the first thing you did when the computer wasn't working was you went in and you ran your fingers over the tops of all the integrated circuits on the motherboards to try and find the one that had slipped out of its socket and needed to be pushed back in. This was called massaging the chips. Well, we, I did finish that thesis had the great good fortune to move on to 
the Princeton Observatory. I guess because I had gotten, somebody had said that I was pretty decent with dealing with hardware and electronics and things. I managed to get a job with a group of astronomers and engineers in the Princeton Observatory who were developing the wide field camera for a space telescope. Back then it wasn't called the Hubble Space Telescope, it was called the Large Space Telescope, but it's the same device that we know today as Hubble, and that's still in orbit and working. Now this telescope was going to be operating above the Earth's atmosphere, which meant that it would be opening a revolutionary new vista onto the universe. Uh, astronomers would be able to see with unprecedented clarity uh, views of the universe that heretofore had been blurred by the atmosphere of the Earth. Once you got above that atmosphere, you got a much, much sharper view of things. But to take pictures, you have to have a device that takes a picture and then transmits it back to the ground. And at that time, the only thing was digital tube technology, the same sorts of technology <coughs> used in the TV cameras that I just spoke about a minute ago. So this is a SEC secondary electron conduction Viticon tube. At the front it had one of these photocathode things that when light hit it would emit <coughs> electrons. This section of rings here had a high voltage of a couple of thousand volts that accelerated the electrons along the tube. The whole thing was immersed in a magnetic field with coils of magnets around it that focused those electrons back onto a target about that part of the tube, and you could develop an electronic Im image on that target that was the exact analog of the optical image that fell on the photocathode. So you'd get an electronic image, but because of the high voltage of acceleration, for every electron coming off the photocathode, you'd get about a thousand electrons recorded on this target. And then after you had taken your exposure, uh, an electron beam would sweep across the target this back section of the tube and read how much charge was there, that signal would come out, get digitized, sent down to the ground, and astronomers would have their image taken with the space telescope. This was about the only technology available. So it was the front runner. Uh, everybody assumed this was what was going to go on the telescope. It had several advantages. It was big. Uh, when I got to Princeton, they were building 25 millimeter versions of these tubes, but they soon went to a 50 millimeter version, and that was the size that the space telescope required for its wide field camera. They were also quite good in the blue. The photocathodes had good sensitivity in the blue. About 25% of the light or so that struck the photocathode would get recorded on the target. Unfortunately, they had poor response in the red. Only 5% or so of the red light that struck the target got recorded. So it, that was certainly a drawback. Well, we went through the process of testing these, getting them ready to go. And about a year before NASA was to make the final decision on giving us the go-ahead to build the flight models of these tubes, uh, and put together the whole instrument for the Hubble Space Telescope, a new sort of detector was discovered. A solid state detector, not these electron video things, but a thing called a CCD, made out of silicon, which is also photosensitive. When light hits silicon, it liberates an electron. But the real advantage of a CCD, it's incredibly sensitive when you can detect almost single electron events. So you don't need to amplify the signal. You can just record the number of photons hitting the device, and for every photon that hits, you get an electron in the CCD detector, and pretty much you can measure every electron. Well, not in those days. Those first CCDs that came out in competition with this guy weren't so sensitive and they had a lot of noise associated with them. And they had other drawbacks. They were small, they were a fraction of the size of this tube. And while they were very good in the red, they had almost no sensitivity in the blue. So they were sort of the opposite in terms of color sensitivity of this tube. 
So we were pretty confident we would win this competition because we sort of met all the specifications. And NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the people that launched the Space Telescope uh, and run all of the U.S.'s space program, is noted for being a very conservative organization. They don't like to take chances. So they uh, required everything to be proven in excruciating detail. Uh, you had to almost know where every bit of material uh, was mined that made up the, your device and trace it all the way from the mine through manufacture into your devices. Uh, NASA was very strict. So while there was promise shown by these CCDs, we said there's no way that NASA's going to go with that technology, that unproven new technology that could blow up in their faces uh, a year or two down the road. So we were shocked, shocked, when NASA made the decision, the fateful decision, to abandon this technology and go with the brand new CCD technology for the white field camera on Space Telescope. It's probably the boldest decision NASA's ever made, and it was one of its best decisions, because those really were much better technology than these things. And they got, they developed very rapidly, so that by the time Space Telescope was launched, and fortunately it was delayed for several years, which gave the CCD technology some time to catch up. By the time it was launched, it had very competitive detectors, and they've gotten better and better in the years since. Nowadays, uh, the CCD is the detector of choice in almost every field of astronomy. But that meant I was sort of out of a job. I guess if there are lessons for those of you who do instrument development is never, be, never underestimate the competition and never put all your eggs in one basket. So while I was still at Princeton, uh, there was a group at the University of Wisconsin that was developing a thing called Fabry Perot. This is a tunable filter, interferometer. It's a filter in the sense that it selects just one color of light to pass through it but tunable in that you can change the wavelength of light or the color of light that will pass through this device. It allows you to make a different kind of spectrograph. Heretofore, spectrographs had a single object, like a star, that fell on a slit, and the light was dispersed into its composite colors, and you recorded that single object spectrum on your film or your digital camera or your CCD camera, but it was just a single object. So if you're trying to map a whole large object like a galaxy or a cloud of interstellar gas or something like that, you, uh, you had to do it a piece at a time. It would be very laborious and take a lot of telescope time, and telescope time is precious. The advantage of the Fabry Pro is it gives you the whole image at once, so you can take the a map of an entire galaxy or cloud of gas or cluster of stars. So it's very efficient in that way. But its drawback is it only takes one color at a time. So you have to step through the different colors of the spectrum that you're trying to record, taking a picture at each place. So there's some projects for which a Fabry Pro is a great device, and it's the detector of choice. And there are other projects for which a normal spectrograph is the way you want to go. It just depends on the science you're trying to do. But these guys at Wisconsin had these Fabry Pros. They were sort of the world's experts in them. What they didn't have was competitive cameras, devices to take an image of the light that came through their Fabry Pro. We at Princeton had no, we didn't know anything about Fabry Pros, but we had detectors. We had both the Viticon detectors and we too had some of these new CCDs that we were trying to evaluate. So we could marry our CCD device with their Fabry Pro device and do some revolutionary new things. They came out to Princeton one cold winter's night. Cold winters in the U.S. are a lot colder than winters around here. Uh, and we put this device on a small one meter telescope that was located in Princeton that wasn't much good for research because it was in the middle of a city, lots of bright lights around and stuff, but was good for testing. And we took this image of Jupiter. There's a calling slide here. Jupiter is actually there. That's just a 
dot that's been put on the image so you can see where Jupiter is. Its light has actually been blocked. And we, the thing we were interested in was detecting this blob of light here. That's a mission from a cloud of gas that's associated with the moon Io as it orbits around Jupiter. Uh, it had been known that Io emitted gas. Nobody sort of knew why. Uh, and one of the things we wanted to study was what sorts of materials were in that gas and how was it distributed around this Io, this torus that stretched like a donut around the equatorial belt of the planet at the distance out of Io's orbit. So this is actually a cloud of uh, sulfur <coughs> gas, and we also measured uh, hydrogen and other elements in, in that with this device. So this started me, for better or for worse, down a path that I've followed ever since, dealing with these fabric growths. These de Although Wisconsin built the best fabric grows in the world at the time, they were really hard to use because they were mechanical devices. They were held together with screws and springs. And you had to make the two plates of glass that produced the interference that made this filtering effect. You had to hold these parallel to each other to within about a hundredth of a wavelength of light. And that's really, really small. And that's hard to keep and make things that parallel. And you did this by tweaking the screws around the side, putting different pressure on these springs, and moving the plates ever so slightly until they came into parallelism the way you wanted them. Well, you could do that, and there were techniques, and it only took you 10 or 15 minutes to do that job. One of the problems was you got it just nicely parallel, and then you have to tap on the side of it with a screwdriver to release, release the tension in the springs, and that would usually make everything move. And you have to adjust the pressure with the screws a little bit, tap on it, everything, and move again. So you can spend a long time getting these things parallel. You put it in the telescope, you took some images, but of course the telescopes track across the sky as they compensate for the Earth's rotation. So as the telescope tracks, the direction of the force of the Earth's gravity changes, pulls on these plates a little bit, and takes them out of parallelism again. So it was a difficult instrument to use, but I was young. How young? Look at the characters in this picture. Um, I had a lot more hair, though, <laughs> both on my face and on my head. Uh, this was a postdoc, Nelson Caldwell's work with this and my colleague Rutgers uh, of Bob Shaw. Uh, we became aware of a fledgling company in England that had a new idea that promised to make these, uh, these fabric pro devices much easier to use. Uh, this is a picture of the device. It's called an Edlon. It's just a fancy name to confuse the uninitiated. Uh, and instead of having springs and screws, it had what are called piezoelectric crystals. These are devices that, as you change the voltage across them, they get bigger or smaller, the more voltage electrical voltage you put across the crystal, the bigger it gets. So you can relatively easily, with electronic control, change the spacing and the separation of the plates. And it had a capacitance micrometry to measure the separation of the plates. And this was all put together in a feedback loop that stabilized things. So the capacitors would detect that when the telescope moved, the gravity vector changed, the plates shifted a little bit, it would change the voltage on the crystals and make the plates parallel again. This was a much easier device to use than the old spring and screw things. And that's probably why I had so much hair at the time. I wasn't ripping it out, <laughs> trying to deal with those old style interferometers. We put this together in an instrument that at first traveled around to several telescopes around the US but then we decided that the right way to do this was to put it at one place and make it available to everybody in the country. And uh, so we put it at the Sierra Tololo Inter-American Observatory, the U.S. National Observatory in the Southern Hemisphere, located in the Andes Mountains of Chile. Here's a picture. And we used this on the big telescope, the four-meter, 
and the next biggest telescope, the 1.5 meter. It was there for 14 years uh, and produced a variety of good scientific projects. There's a sample, there's a map of the velocities in a galaxy, color-coded so that red's moving away from us, blue's coming towards us, green's at intermediate velocity, and uh, we were able to do a lot of good science with this device. So that was a successful interlude. While this was going on, the holy grail <coughs> of astronomical instrumentation was photon counting. Uh, at the end, the CCD device is an analog device. It has some noise associated with it. And if you could just count every photon that comes from the sky and comes through your instrument to your detector, uh, you would have a virtually noise-free measurement. There's some statistical noise associated with the photons themselves, but aside from that, there's no other noise. It's the best, lowest noise way to take an image. We were seduced, I think is the right word to use, by this concept, uh, and we thought this would be a good thing to use with Fabry Pro because the Fabry Pro only puts through one color, not much light, light levels are low. Having a low noise way of recording that light is a good thing. So we got one of these devices called a resistive anode detector. It had a photocathode in the front and an electron acceleration section, just like some of the other tubes I showed to you and described. Uh, the difference was the target. This was a resistive target. So when the cloud of electrons that hit that target, about a thousand electrons for every photon that came in uh, to the front, uh, they would generate voltages, and because of the resistivity of the target, you get different voltages at the different corners, depending on just where that cloud of electrons hit. If it hit near a corner, the voltage would be high. If it hit far away from the corner, the voltage would be low. So by measuring all four corner voltages, you can calculate where each electron cloud hit the detector's target and thus where the photon came from, from the sky. So you could count that a photon hit and you knew where it was. It was an imaging photon counter. Great. The problem, and there were several, was that, again, it was a photocathode-based device. These have much lower efficiencies than, or sensitivities than the silicon-based devices. So you didn't have to expose a silicon-based device very long before you had more information recorded and a higher signal-to-noise ratio than one of these guys did. So it actually only was good for noisy signals rather than producing really high-quality high signals. And another problem was because of details of the internal structure of these devices, the electrons got fed back and tended to destroy the photocathodes in a sh relatively short period of time. So they died, they particularly lost their red sensitivity. So given all those problems, after spending a little while working with these things, we rapidly returned to our senses, abandoned the siren song of photon counting, and went back to uh, solid state detectors. While I was still working with the, what's called the Rutgers Fabric Pro or the RFP uh, in Chile and doing a lot of good scientific measurements with that, I stayed in contact with my colleagues back at Princeton, which is only about 30 kilometers away from Rutgers, it's just down the road. And they were working on a space project, something to do on the space shuttle. Uh, this was to be a ultraviolet spectrograph called IMAPS, the <coughs> Interstellar Medium Absorption Profile Spectrograph. It would work at very high spectral resolutions, very fine determination of the colors of the light coming from stars, and work far down into the ultraviolet at, at wavelengths that do not come through the Earth's atmosphere, which is a good thing. If, if the wavelengths of the ultraviolet light uh, that this thing was sensitive to pierce the Earth's atmosphere, you get a sunburn uh, like that. So the Earth's atmosphere protects us from that ultraviolet radiation. 
but it also means that astronomers can't measure those wavelengths. And sometimes there's some really crucial information in those parts of the spectrum. So the idea here was to fly this telescope with a spectrograph that worked in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum up on the space shuttle. Uh, it would be taken up, the spacecraft would be put overboard and left to fly free for a couple of weeks while the astronauts went about doing other things and other experiments. The space shuttle flew out of the way by several hundred miles uh, and this telescope would work autonomously. And then at the end of the flight, the space shuttle would rendezvous with it, put the grapple with its robot arm, put the instrument and the spacecraft back into the cargo bay and bring it back down to Earth so that the whole instrument could be reused again. And the spacecraft, which is most of what you see in this picture, was built by a, the German space agency called, it's called Astrospace. And it flew four different times. Uh, we flew this IMAPS mission on it twice. I was involved in producing a lot of the software for this. So I got to write the software that not only ran the detector, but also that talked to the spacecraft and communicated back to the ground stations on Earth and things. So it was an interesting and ch different challenge from the sorts of things I spent most of my time doing. Uh, this is the patch of the mission. Uh, this is a sample spectrum. And what you see here, every place there's a dark band, that's an absorption line caused by an element in the atmosphere of the star and the, the, the strengths of those absorption lines that we were trying to measure. I got to go to the Cape for a launch. Uh, I got to see the launch, which was really spectacular. Too bad that that doesn't happen anymore because the space shuttle is now retired because it, it was one of the most spectacular things I think I've ever seen. Uh, and then I stayed and helped operate the spacecraft. Here's a picture of Astrospas after it had been deployed from the shuttle before the shuttle was pulled too far away. And our piece of it is this long silver tube on this side. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, got to do some different things. Uh, I didn't stay in the space game. It was a pretty hard game to play. Uh, so I returned to ground-based astronomy and have been happily there ever since. Got a couple minutes. I uh, have to tell you one story about the launch of this thing. We were there with the team from Princeton and Berkeley and some other universities that all, all collaborated on this instrument. And one of the guys on the team was an ex-US Marine uh, who had a very typical Marine attitude. He was all, let's go, let's do it, let's go, go, go. Um, and we were being taken around and got to climb up on the gantry and look at lots of things on the spacecraft. Got a really in-depth view of the space shuttle, um, which you don't normally get unless you spend a year or two of your life working on these projects. And now you not just turned loose to do this. We had a NASA minder who was walking with us and making sure we went to the right places and didn't touch anything we weren't supposed to touch and things like that. And she was this nice old lady. She was probably going to retire in a year or so. So we were going up, and we got pretty far up in the gantry. And this Marine guy says, can we go down there? And she says, well, I don't know. And by that time, he was halfway down the, <laughs> the ring. So of course, she had to follow along. And we all trooped along with her. We came up, and this was the way the crew actually got into the space shuttle, so it was their entryway. We came up to the hatch to the cabin door of the space shuttle, which was open because they were getting everything ready for launch. He says, can we go in there? She says, well, I don't think it. By that time, he was already in the cabin, and so we got to go and stick our heads inside the space shuttle. So I can say, I haven't fully been in the space shuttle, but my head and my shoulders have. So that was a lot of fun. I guess it pays to have a Marine on your team. <laughs> well, around 1998, uh, this new idea came along about a telescope in South Africa. 
Rutgers had been trying to get into a big telescope partnership for probably about 10 years without much success. Uh, it was hard to raise the money. Uh, when, there were, when we had money, we didn't have a telescope consortium to join. When there was a telescope consortium available, we didn't have money. It was hard to match the two things together. So we had not been successful in joining a large telescope consortium. When these two guys, Robert Stobie, who was the, the director of the SAAO, my predecessor, Choice Removed, and Kotsal McKaylee, who was the director of the National uh, Research Foundation uh, in <coughs> South Africa, came to town uh, saying, there's this great new idea that we've got. There's this telescope in Texas called the Hobby Ebro <coughs> Telescope, which we had known was one of the ones we had thought about getting into <coughs> earlier. And it sort of has this clever set of ideas that even though it's a really big <coughs> telescope, make it much cheaper than any other telescope of comparable size. Uh, one of the smart ideas was that instead of having a parabolic mirror, it has a spherical mirror. Spherical mirrors are much easier to make than parabolic mirrors. It has a segmented spherical mirror, <coughs> 91 segments, because, but because it's a sphere, they're all identical. So you can just make 91 of exactly the same thing, and that forms your primary mirror. It's an 11 meter mirror. This is about five stories tall, weighs a couple hundred tons. It's, it's a big piece of equipment. And to steer that across the sky, to point it accurately at the, device, at the object you want to look at, and then track it to take out the Earth's rotation is a daunting engineering task. And that's been solved and was solved at the time of these telescopes. Notably, the Keck telescope was a, another 10-meter telescope that was built in Hawaii. But it was horrendously expensive, and a lot of that expense went into the engineering of getting this enormous piece of steel and glass and concrete to all move with precision. Salt solved that problem by not moving at all. During an observation, it just sits fixed. But of course, there's a problem with this, because while the telescope is fixed, the Earth is rotating, so that means images move through the field of view because the Earth is rotating and taking the telescope along with it. To compensate, there's a tracker up at the top of the telescope that moves and just follows the image across the focal plane. So this tracker has to be a pretty good piece of engineering in and of itself, but it's a lot smaller and lighter than the entire telescope, so it's easier and cheaper to build a precision moving tracker than to move the whole thing. And this allows you to take data on any single object for about an hour. Sometimes more, depending on where you are in the sky, but an hour is a typical exposure time. This concept, or this combination of concepts, put this kind of telescope within the reach of a consortium of several universities or smaller governments. You didn't have to have the entire financial resources of the U.S. Uh, National Treasury behind you to build one of these things. So Rutgers signed on, and we joined with other partners around the world. And the first time I visited IUCA was in 2004, I think it was, uh, when we brought this concept here and tried to convince the astronomers at IUCA that this would be a good thing to, for them to participate in also because it was by far the cheapest 10-meter telescope they could get into. And amazingly enough, you can fool some of the people some of the time, and they bought our line, and they bought into the telescope. <laughs> so Ayuga is now a respected partner in the SALT consortium. We broke ground in 2000. The telescope was essentially complete in the fall in like November of 2005. This is the president of South Africa, Tabo Mbeke, uh, inaugurating the telescope. We were happy as clams, or chuffed, as they say in South Africa. I'm slowly learning the lingo. Uh, and it was great. And of course, after the politicians were there, and we all had the sip of wine and listened to the speeches, and then they all went away, we rolled up our sleeves and started to get the thing to work. 
And we discovered soon, to our horror, that there was a serious problem. The telescope was not imaging properly. Instead of having nice, sharp, round, stellar images, they looked double or triple or like little triangles or tadpoles in different corners of the field of view. And worse, they changed all the time. Uh, when the telescope pointed to a different place in the sky, the images were still distorted, but they were distorted in different ways. And if the temperature changed, the image distortion pattern changed. And you could come back the next night, uh, point to the same point in the sky, and the distortion pattern would be different from what it was the previous night. You'd do this at the same temperature on two different nights, and the distortion pattern would be different. It was a complete mystery. We did not understand what was going wrong, but we knew we had a serious problem on our hands. It took about three years to solve this problem. It took about a year, well, it took about six months to convince ourselves that it really was a problem, that we weren't doing other things wrong, but that there was something really wrong with the telescope. You don't want to rip a telescope apart when it's just been built if you're doing something stupid somewhere else. So it took a while to convince ourselves, yeah, there was really a problem in the telescope. And then it took probably another year to diagnose where in the telescope was it. Was it in this segmented primary mirror? Was it in the spherical aberration corrector that fixed the enormous amount of spherical aberration that an 11 meter sphere puts in? Was it something in the tracker? Was it something in the imaging devices? That was a real detective story. And in the end, it was tracked down to the spherical aberration corrector. Turns out, just like most stories, it was a rather simple explanation in the end. <coughs> the problem was that this telescope was built by a team of engineers in South Africa, but they contracted out pieces of it to various companies around the world. And the spherical aberration corrector was contracted out to a company in France. And so the team in South Africa that designed and built the telescope gave this company a set of specifications of this is how you should build the spherical aberration corrector. It must perform in this way and that way and have all these characteristics. And they said, now when you bolt it onto the telescope, assume you're bolting it to a perfectly rigid surface. Is there ever a perfectly rigid surface? No, of course not. Things change with temperature and as the gravity loading changes and moves around. There is no such thing as a perfectly rigid surface. But that's what these guys were told to build to. Assume that your mounting surface is perfectly rigid. They said, Molly, that's a good idea. And so they went and built this thing. Uh, it showed that it met specification, delivered to the telescope. The problem, of course, was that the surface of this bolted tube wasn't perfectly rigid. So when the telescope moved or sagged or the temperature changed, stresses were transmitted through this interface that moved the optical elements of the spherical aberration corrector around. Once we figured that out, then the solution was pretty straightforward. You change the scheme of mounting. You recognize that, indeed, the mounting surface is not perfectly rigid and you build taking into account the flexures of the mounting surface. And after three years, the sack went back on the telescope and we got the images we had been expecting all along. There was another problem with the spectrograph that took another year or so to fix. But eventually, in 2011, there was another ceremony with another plaque. It's always good to have plaques. And inaugurating the start of real science operations, and since that time, SALT has been turning out data successfully, and to the pleasure of astronomers and all the partner institutions around the world that are part of the SALT consortium. Now, I was involved in part of this uh, telescope, as you might expect, I was still following by February Perot inclinations, and there's a spectrograph at the top end of the telescope, the so-called prime focus, where the light from the primary comes to focus after it passes through the spectrum 
the spheric libration corrector, now properly supported. And uh, this is the instrument. It's a pretty complicated instrument. In fact, it's a very complicated instrument. It has many different modes. It's been described as the Swiss Army knife of spectrographs. And these two little shiny things there are the Febri Pro Elons that go into the beam when it's working in Febri Pro mode. The detector is this thing here, there are gratings up here, there are filters in the back, there's optics everywhere, there's cables and electronics everywhere. It's a pretty complicated instrument, but sometimes it works. Uh, we have a lot of trouble getting things going, but uh, they have a special hat at the observatory that you wear when something's going well. And here's a, one of the early images of a galaxy taken with the Febri Pro on Sol, and it's now producing a lot of data, and we're quite happy with it. One lesson is that we were way too ambitious when we designed this instrument. We said, there's really only room for one instrument at the prime focus, so let's make it do everything. Boy, was that a bad idea. And this spectrograph is way too complicated. It's hard to maintain. It's hard to keep everything working on it. A piece here breaks, a piece there breaks. Uh, it's currently off the telescope for some refurbishment. Uh, we now look at each other and say, what were we thinking? Why didn't we put the first instrument as a simple instrument? And then once that was working well, we <coughs> want to be more complicated ones. It's easy to let ambition rule your life. Now let me end by talking about the next instrument. It's also a Fabry Pro instrument. This is the successor to the RFP, the Rutgers Fabry Pro, the one that ran on Chile for uh, 14 years. Uh, it was designed to address all the shortcomings of that in instrument and make it much better. And it is the prototype for the scheme that I implemented on the SALT telescope. I got funding for this because, of, basically because of the success of the prior instrument, the one that ran in Chile, uh, and started to build it. And then SALT came along and that took up most of my interest. And so this got put on the back burner and it sort of percolated along slowly. Uh, I realized that the same ideas that were in the ARIES spectrograph, ARIES, by the way, stands for Advanced Rutgers Imaging Edelon Spectrograph. Um, and it's also a constellation. Uh, that the same ideas that I had thought up for ARIES would work just great on SALT. And by and large, they do. The other problem was it had been designed for certain telescopes. I was going to take it back to Chile, put it on the 4 meter and 1.5 meter, but not on the same focal positions that the RFP had. There was a uh, design for a new focal position, slower, uh, longer focal length, that had some advantages uh, to each of them. So it was designed for a slower focal position, and the same slow focus was available also on two other telescopes in Chile. The SOAR telescope, a four meter that was under development at the time, and Gemini, the eight meter U.S. National Southern Telescope. So it seemed to make sense to design this for an F14 uh, focal ratio. After the design was frozen and the optics were built, CTIO decommissioned the F14 focus on the four meter, they decided to never use the F15 focus on the 1.5 meter. I didn't want to get involved with the complexities of Gemini, which turned out to be a, a real mess uh, bureaucratically, and SOAR had been delayed for several years because of other problems. So it was a spectrograph without a home, uh, because the only available large telescope focal positions were much faster F7 and the optics wouldn't work with that. So the instrument's now completed. I shipped it down to South Africa. And fortunately, there is a telescope, the 1.9 meter, in South Africa, on uh, which it will go. It has the right focal ratio. So hopefully sometime in the next year or so, I'll have time to get this instrument mounted on the telescope and get it producing data. So it's been a long, winding road. Uh, I certainly enjoyed all of the 
twists and turns it takes. I don't think I would have been a, wouldn't have been a, just an observer. I really like building instruments. Um, so it's been a good career. I can recommend it to some of those of you who are students uh, because um, we really need instrumentalists. You won't get all the attention or the glory that some of the observers get, but you'll have a good satisfaction when your instrument works and when you know it's your instrument that produced the data that made it possible for some of those other people to make the observations that got the headlines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for the advice for the youngsters here. Yes, we have seen a lot of talks with a lot of pretty pictures, but this has been a very frank sharing of experiences with all the problems which really come to people who work in instrumentation and in other fields of astronomy. So thank, thanks again for that. Uh, we have time for more interaction, and since there are less people, I think there will be some questions which could be answered here. Sir, I have two questions. First is, as we know, the primary way is divided into hexagonal segments. So, what is so special about that shape, hexagon? And the second question is, is there any, is there any obstruction due to the secondary layer situated in the center of our primary? Yes. Uh, Hexagons, the formal mathematical word is tessellate. They pack together. You can put them close together. If you have uh, circles, there's a lot of wasted space because the circles don't, the edges don't butt up against each other. And uh, squares, although they match, when you start tipping them and things, it, you get into problems. So the hexagon is the <coughs> right figure to put together a segmented primary. And all segmented primary mirrors are based on hexagons, the Keck telescopes, our telescope, the TMT telescope that South Africa is going to, sorry, that Mayuka is going to be a part of, and the, uh, all of the Indian astronomers are going to be a part of. So it's just the best geometrical shape for packing the <coughs> mirrors close together and making it essentially a continuous surface. There's still little gaps in between. Uh, and indeed, the secondary structure shadows part of the primary. That's inevitable in almost every telescope design, that part of your primary mirror is in shadow, but the secondary structure is usually much smaller than the primary, so only 5 or 10% of the mirror's area gets shadowed, and the rest of it's active. What do multiply? How do you determine the uh, direction of the light coming from? As in, it's just a small device compared to CCD. So how do you to determine the direction of the light? So the idea behind the photomultipliers is that, indeed, when a photon hits the photocathode, electrons come off in a, a variety of directions. So you need some sort of electromagnetic uh, focusing section. But if you're clever about how you design your electrical and magnetic fields, the electrons will spiral around the magnetic fields, and if you design it with the right strength magnetic and electric field, they'll complete one or an integer number of spirals, and when they hit the target, they'll be right back where they were when they left the photocathode. So you develop an image on the target that's an exact, or almost exact, replica of what was on the target. Uh, sir, at the end of the session, we said that uh, there are many opportunities for the answers. So, uh, sir, can you elaborate what kind of opportunities uh, there are? For example, I am a computer science engineer, but I want to get in this field. So, what should be my path so that I can get there? There are many different careers in astronomy. And certainly, astronomy is completely linked up with computers. It's sort of obvious through most of this talk that computers are important for controlling the telescopes, controlling the instruments, taking the data, reducing the data. Every part of an astronomer's life is directly affected by computers up to presenting the results on a screen. So uh, if computer science is what really turns you on, there's ways of being to following that uh, interest in astronomy. There are lots of ways of following that interest in astronomy. On the other hand, if you're really motivated to be an astronomer, uh, there are lots of other jobs, and lots of other ways to be an astronomer. So the classical way is to be an observer, somebody who goes to the telescope, takes data, 
analyzes the data, doesn't particularly build the instruments or the telescopes that make the data, uh, but uses the telescopes and instruments that exist to carry out a scientific program, analyze the data, and turn it into scientific results. And that inevitably requires some computer expertise as well. Um, and, and there's theorists, people that never go near a telescope, but uh, use astrophysical theory to try and understand some of the results that the astronomers, the observational astronomers discover and make sense of it all. My, I've had an extremely productive collaboration with uh, to another observer and a theorist, uh, a radio astronomy observer who was a postdoc working with us at Rutgers, is now at a Canadian university as a professor, uh, myself an optical observer, instrument builder, and a dynamical theorist. Uh, we, he can suggest clever observations to make. We have the understanding and the wherewithal to make the observations and hopefully make them right and reduce the data, and then he can analyze that data and discover some interesting things about galaxies, like how much dark matter a galaxy has and how it's distributed. So that's been an extremely productive collaboration. It only works because there's one of us who's an expert in radio astronomy, one of us who's an expert in optical astronomy, and one of us who's an expert in theory. So it takes all types. The most important thing is to do something that excites you. Don't do something because you think you'll make a lot, bunch of money in it. Uh, certain, you know, don't go into astronomy for fame and fortune. You won't be satisfied. And that's not going to happen. Uh, you have to do something you like. You have to get up every morning and say, I really want to go to work today because I've got these observations of this galaxy. But if, if I just figure out how to reduce them correctly, I'll learn something new. That's what, what will make you happy and will make you a successful career in astronomy. So you said about the spectrograph and ultraviolet rays. So is there any possibility that you can use gamma rays as well uh, to get a remote sensing picture about this? Thing? There are gamma ray telescopes. Uh, a new gamma ray telescope is being put together in Namibia and there's a competition between Namibia and uh, Chile for the next big project called the Cherenkov Telescope Array, which will not be as big as the square kilometer array uh, that you're all familiar with, uh, but it will be another massive <coughs> project in the gamma ray region. Unfortunately, gamma rays are very hard to deal with, uh, so you can't you build a typical spectrograph in the way that works in the optical with a dispersion <coughs> rating or a uh, prism to disperse the gamma rays and record their different wavelengths or energies. You have to use different techniques like crystal scintillometers and other stuff that I'm not very familiar with and uh, can't get as detailed of spectral information in the gamma ray part of the spectrum as you can in the optical. But gamma ray astronomy is really in its infancy compared to optical or radio astronomy. So there are a lot of interesting questions to be solved, problems to be solved, questions to be answered, and more questions to be discovered and asked in that field that will develop rapidly over the coming decade or so. Um, I recognize that uh, what is the likelihood that, uh, the likelihood that uh, there is a habitable planet out there somewhere in the universe? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, when I was a lad back at the beginning of this talk in the 70s, that was a question that we had no clue about the answer because we know, knew of no other planet except the ones in our solar system. We knew there were billions and billions and billions of stars in our own galaxy and in billions of other galaxies. We assumed that there were planets orbiting around those other stars but there was no evidence one way or the other. So we had no basis for speculation. And that's why there are lots of interesting science fiction stories <coughs> written at that time, which are now completely wrong, because we know so much more about stars and planets in our own solar system and 
other things. So it was only about 15 years ago that the technology came together to be able to start detecting planets around other stars. It's a really daunting task because stars are bright and planets are faint, so it's hard to make a direct image. You have to have indirect ways of detecting them. But it's very successful. We now know of four or five or 6,000 planets orbiting around other stars. So that's answered part of the question. Are there planets other than in our solar system? We now know, yes, the answer is a resounding yes. A large fraction of the stars out there have planets orbiting around them. Now, are any of those planets suitable for life? We are beginning to find planets in a variety of distances from their stars. Turns out it's easiest to find the ones closest to their stars because they have the biggest effect on their stars. They make the stars wiggle around a little more. So you preferentially find big planets close in. Uh, those don't tend to be very good life sites. You know, we know there's no life, no obvious life on Jupiter, a big planet in our solar system. If you move Jupiter inside Mercury's orbit, it would be a very inhospitable place for life. So those aren't very good life sites. And it's much harder to detect small planets, planets like the Earth, while orbiting at a distance of one astronomical unit around another star, the distance the Earth is away, in the so-called habitable zone where the temperature is right to have liquid water on the surface and the other things that we think are a requirement of life. But we're beginning to discover those now. There are a few planets known that do exist in the right distance from their star and have about the right size. So, and I'm sure as time goes on, the pace of discovery of planets from other stars is only going to continue and accelerate. So we'll find more and more and more of those kinds of planets that look sort of like Earth. Earth's going around other stars. We still don't have the technology to decide whether there's life in those planets. Uh, it's pretty obvious that there's no life like on our planet. Life that beams radio signals into space, that has traffic jams and pollution that uh, pollute its atmosphere, that uh, light up their cities at night as bright, shining beacons. Those are things we could detect. We could, if there were cities like Mumbai and Delhi on one of these planets, we would know it because we would see the varying of light as the planet rotated, and sometimes you saw the city, sometimes you didn't. So there's no advanced civilization on the planets that we've found so far that's betraying its presence to the universe the way we are. But that doesn't mean that they're not smarter than we are, and have found ways not to pollute their atmospheres, and waste a lot of energy shining light into the sky at night, and other things like that. Or it could be their life forms much less advanced than we are. Um, so there are fish swimming around in the ocean, or trees and plants <coughs> on the land, all life forms, but not the sorts of life forms that would be easy for us to detect. To detect those, we have to take very high resolution spectra of the atmosphere of the planet itself and look for the effects of life on that atmosphere. Production of uh, carbon dioxide uh, by mammals and things or production of oxygen by plants through photosynthesis. And we don't quite have the technology to do that yet. It's getting close. Another five or ten years or so we'll probably be able to do that. So then we'll begin to make some real answers to those questions of is there are there life forms at least that have chemist biochemistry like us on other planets. Of course we'll probably we always think in terms of ourselves. You see any movie about aliens, you get a nose, they got two arms, they got two legs. What's the chance that an alien looks like us? Probably very slim. They probably look very different. And they may, their biology may be very different. So when we start looking for things that have biochemical signatures on their planet's atmosphere, like life on the Earth, we may be looking in all the wrong places. So if the star is moving other from us, so I heard somewhere it is red shifted. Does it mean that it really looks red or uh, 
Is there some other meaning to that word? Yes, uh, it's called the Doppler effect. You can hear it in, uh, in the waves of sound as well as in the waves of light. If a ambulance is coming towards you and passes by you, as it comes towards you, the pitch of the siren seems to go up. And then when it passes by you, the pitch of the siren seems to go down. Or in a race car going around the racetrack, the same thing. It comes in and goes as it goes by. That's the shift towards the blue, shorter wavelengths, as it comes towards you, and the shift towards the red, longer wavelengths, as it goes away from you. And the same thing happens in light. So in that's how these colors were determined basically by measuring the shifts of lines. So by spectral lines is shifted towards the red in this part of the galaxy and towards the blue in that part of the galaxy because the galaxy is rotating the part that's moving away from us with respect to the center, the part that's coming towards us. So it's a real shift. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, we've, we've come to know that uh, astronomy and technology, I mean, science and technology go hand in hand and they augment each other all the time. So hopefully all the students here who are into technology will also be interested in contributing to science through their talent. As uh, Sir Williams has said that there are opportunities and this country, India, and its scientists will also be uh, going into various mega projects in, uh, in the recent future. We are uh, going into the 30 meter telescope, the large uh, uh, gravitational observatory which is coming up. There's a neutrino observatory coming up. And there's, of course, the uh, large radio telescope, the square kilometer array in which Indian uh, scientists are involved. So all of you have some chance somewhere to get in. But the thing is, you have to follow it up. So just don't forget that you, you were asking about the opportunities. So there are lots of opportunities. And you should you have to follow it up proactively. Well, thank you, sir, for giving us this opportunity to uh, listen to you and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>